Muy bien. Sean todos y todas bienvenidas a la segunda jornada del primer Congreso Transnacional de Sostenibilidad y Desarrollo Local en la península de Yucatán. Por parte de los organizadores y mi persona, muchísimas gracias por sintonizarnos desde su pequeño rincón en el mundo. Me permito presentarme. Mi nombre es Sabrina Calderón, soy estudiante de Ingeniería en Energías Renovables y será todo un placer acompañarlos al menos en este ratito de la mañana, abordando temas de suma importancia, de gran peso, que implican nuestro desarrollo como sociedad desde una perspectiva sostenible. La temática del día de hoy es Ingeniería y Sustentabilidad para el Bienestar Social. Esta área temática incluye ideas ingenieriles con aplicaciones sustentables, desarrollo e implementación de proyectos de ingeniería con tecnología madura a favor de la sociedad. Todas estas aplicaciones pueden estar relacionadas desde agua, energía, salud, agricultura, problemas ambientales en general, entre otros. Al inicio de esta sesión tendré el gusto de moderar las tres conferencias magistrales, las cuales tendrán lugar a continuación, donde cada una durará aproximadamente una hora. Después de estas tres primeras conferencias, nos seguirán diferentes presentaciones orales, en donde tendremos gente de todas partes hablando de temas de gran interés. Y no olviden considerar que tenemos un break de la 1.20 a las 2.20 de la tarde. Aprovecho para comentarles en este ratito que el, la pro, el programa, la dinámica que vamos a llevar a cabo para al menos las conferencias magistrales será la siguiente. Cada presentación oral tendrá una duración de 45 minutos seguido de 10 minutos de preguntas de la audiencia. Así que les pedimos con muchísimo cariño que por favor chequen los comentarios. Ahí se les dejó un correo, un número de WhatsApp para que puedan mandar sus preguntas y en el tiempo designado yo las leo. Ahora haré la misma presentación en inglés, dado que muchos de nuestros escuchas o la gente que se sintonice el día de hoy o más adelante tenga la posibilidad de entender lo que estamos haciendo el día de hoy. So, please be welcome to the second day of this, this first transnational co congress on sustainability and local development in the Yucatan Peninsula. On behalf of the organizers and myself, we thank you very much for tuning in from your little corner in this world. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Sabrina Calderon, and I'm currently studying engineering and renewable energies, and it will be my pleasure to accompany you and everyone else in this amazing Congress through the morning, addressing issues of great importance or our development as a society from a sustainable perspective. So today's theme is engineering and sustainability for social welfare. This thematic area includes engineering ideas with sustainable applications, development, implementations of engineering projects with mature technology in favor of society. The applications can be related to water, energy, health, agriculture, food, housing, environmental problems, among others. At the beginning of this session, I will have the pleasure of moderating the three master conferences that will take place next, lasting one hour each from 9 a.m. till noon. After this, we'll have the pleasure of listening to different oral presentations lasting approximately 20 minutes each. Let's not forget to consider we have a little recess from 1.20 to 2.20 p.m. I'll take this opportunity before starting to tell you that as part of this program, the dynamics of the master conferences, at least, will be handled as follows. Each master conference will last approximately 45 minutes of oral presentation, following 10 minutes of questions, comments from you, our audience. So any questions and or comments you would like to do, we have already left you a WhatsApp number and, and, and an email for you to leave them and at the designated time I will read them. Sin más que decir, vamos a darle la bienvenida a nuestro primer conferencista. Voy a seguir esta dinámica de español e inglés, sobre todo porque nuestro, la primera conferencia será en inglés. 
So without any further say, please let me introduce you to our to our first com lecture. Um, if you could please turn on, turn off, sorry, your microphone, it will be great. Thank you. So, Professor Nadim, are you here? Yeah, I can you hear me? Thank you very much. Hi. Hi, really nice Hi. to meet you. If you allow me, I'll read a little bit about yourself so everyone here knows who you are. Uh, thank okay. you very much, uh, Sabrina. Uh, I'm Nadim and uh, I'm from Pakistan. I'm a Dean of Engineering and Technology at International Islamic University. And uh, bear with me because here we have some internet connection because of the cable fault in the uh, Arabian Peninsula. And that's why we have uh, some, uh, some internet connectivity issues. So we might have some sort of hiccups, uh, but I hope that it won't uh, disturb us through, uh, throughout this one hour session we are having today. Let's hope we're not, but well, it's a pleasure having you here. I'll read a little bit something about yourself or our audience, if you allow me. El profesor Nadim, lo doy de primero en español, se desempeña actualmente como decano de la Facultad de Ingeniería y Tecnología. Es de igual manera profesor de Ingeniería Energética en el Departamento de Ingeniería Mecánica de la Universidad Islámica Internacional. Es autor de más de 60 revistas a fa de favor de impacto de gran reputación internacional, Su factor de impacto combinado es superior a los 110. Las áreas claves de investigación y desarrollo incluyen tecnologías energéticas de bajo costo y respetuosas con el medio ambiente y sistemas de energía relacionados. Además, el profesor Nadim está interesado en el modelado energético de edificios, envolturas, en el contexto del hermanamiento digital y los avances recientes este, con sistemas electromecánicos inteligentes. So now in English, so everyone can at least you Thank understand you me. Yeah. Professor Nadim Ahmed Sheikh is currently serving as Dean of Faculty of Engineering and Technology, and he's also Professor of Energy Engineering in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the International Islamic University. He's author of more than 60 impact factor journals of high international reputee. His combined impact factor is more than 110. Key areas of research and development include low-cost, eco-friendly energy technologies and related power systems. In addition, Professor Nadim is interested in building and energy modeling with the context of digital twinning and recent advancements of AI, IoT, and smart electromechanical systems. So, without any further ado, Professor Nadim, the floor is all yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, can I share my screen here? So can you see my screen? Is it, it is visible to you? Yeah, there? it's visible. Yeah. OK, thank you. Uh, first of all, I'm um, thank you. I'll thank you, uh, uh, Rasek and other team members who have arranged this conference. Uh, it is great honor for me to speak at this occasion. And uh, my talk for today is primarily uh, some of the extracts from uh, one of the recent works which I have done with uh, Rasek. And uh, it is about the projecting global water footprint of air conditioning systems, and we'll be talking about the sustainability approach assisted with energetic and economic assessments. And uh, likewise, you have already introduced me as a professor of energy engineering in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the Faculty of Engineering and Technology at International Islamic University. Um, the overview of the talk for today is uh, I'll be talking about some of the air conditioning aspect and specifically from the perspective of the thermal comfort. And then we will uh, look at uh, the uh, the current technologies which are available and then we'll move towards some of the alternate methods which are uh, coming up uh, in the recent market developments and evaluate their uh, local as well as global impact from the perspective of their uh, economics as well as uh, the energy aspect. And uh, we will eventually round off with the global impact calculations, which we will show you here today. So uh, moving towards uh, some of the prime concepts uh, for the general uh, public here, uh, I'll be talking more about the air conditioning. And when we talk about air conditioning, the, the whole purpose of uh, installing an air conditioner in the in a home is to get the thermal comfort. So there are different paradigms which are related to the thermal comfort. and. Uh, 
and uh, when when we walk into uh, some hotel or some uh, bar or some gym or even in hospital uh, we will expect that the the ambience would be uh, cozy and comfortable and uh, this criteria of having a comfort zone uh, in which we want to reside most of the times and specifically uh, as the global warming is taking place and a lot of people are now moving towards the uh, urban centers so and we have more and more built up structures coming out Uh, the concept of thermal comfort is becoming more and more intrigue, uh, and there are a number of factors which are involved in that uh, in that thermal comfort, and it's been a philosophical discussion not only from the engineering perspective but also from the perspective of uh, from the management sciences and other uh, related uh, social sciences that. Uh, what sort of uh, thermal comfort is uh, required and it depends on number of factors including the uh, some of the mechanical factors such as the air speed and humidity and the air temperature to some of the uh, fashions uh, and in terms of the clothing insulation and uh, some of the activities we are performing uh, indoor and uh, the radiant temperature for example is one of the factor so uh, there are uh, there is numerous work uh, which has been carried out on this uh, aspect and uh, uh, we have at least two standards available uh, which are looking at uh, providing the thermal comfort and ensuring that so here in the in the graph which we can see in the center of this slide uh, there are different zones which have been uh, identified and there is uh, air speed on the on the y axis and on the Uh, horizontal axis we can see the operative temperature and this is the indoor temperature and uh, normally speaking uh, we are having a thermal comfort between 20 degree to 27 or 28 degree depending on the air speed we have having so this is the zone where we can uh, feel comfort uh, whether it is uh, hot season or whether it is cold season so in the in the heating season uh, we are heating up uh, the indoor and trying to get the temperature in this range and uh, in the in the cooling zone we are trying to cool it and getting it back into this zone and this is the thermal comfort which is not only from the perspective of having uh, comfort but also having a cozy working environment where we can have a relaxed environment where we can produce and do some uh, productive work now this is a very uh, statistical or stochastic uh, type of issue uh, because it is based on the thermal comfort of the occupants we are having and uh, the pmv which is a vote of the majority of the people which who are residing in that uh, room or place uh they they would vote for what sort of uh, environment they are uh, whether they are comfortable whether it is hot it is cold uh, whether it is too drafty or windy so it is based on the on the on the poll we get and if 80% of the occupants they get satisfied uh, result we can uh, vary between this this scale varies between plus 3 to minus 3 varying from hot warm and slightly warm to the cool and cold region so this is the kind of uh, sensation we people are getting so the sensation which uh, people may get in the hospital uh, if for example if you have an elderly ward or a or a uh, adult ward or a child ward that might be different for all these three conditions and if you go to the gym the condition for the sensitivity of the thermal comfort would be different and the pmv vote will be different so that's why you can see that it is a range and it it varies uh, with the air speed and it also varies with the humidity as well uh, that is also a part which is not exactly depicted here but uh, the humidity the more it is humid inside uh, we get more uh, sweaty palms and uh, if it is too dry we can have a dry skin uh, which is normally seen in the winter season as well so uh, moving to the next uh, part uh, just as i have introduced the thermal comfort and it's uh, it is and, and it's dependent on on different factors uh, and the prime objective is to get the the human comfort and likewise i have already said that uh, we are spending a lot of energy on uh, on on getting this this human comfort and as more and more urbanization is taking place uh the demand for the electricity is also rising and this is the result before before the uh, covid has uh, set in and that's why i've said that this is pre covid results i haven't changed them because uh it covid has has drastically changed this result and if you look at the two years data uh, the building consumption within the uh, domestic and residential and non residential uh, it has increased but uh, Uh, without uh, looking at the covid reason if uh, we look at the data uh, prior to the covid we can see that around 30% of the electricity uh, is consumed in the in the building sector uh, globally worldwide 
and uh, this number uh, varies from region to region uh, for example in the uh, regions which are near to the equator they may have may have lesser consumption of uh, in terms of in the winter season but more consumption in the uh, in the summer season it can be the other way around for those countries which are in the north or in the in the south global south uh, looking at the pakistan because this is where i am residing we are consuming about 50% of the uh, of the energy in the uh, in the domestic and in, in the, for the urban centers and uh, this is taking a lot of uh, around 55% of that 50% of the energy is going uh, for the space heating and cooling this is a lot of energy if you talk about for example if pakistan is uh, consuming 20 gigawatts of electricity so around 5 to 6 gigawatt of electricity is going just for the air conditioning purposes and likewise in the global uh, perspective that's more than 30% actually uh, it is the pre covid data with the more uh, focus on the working from home this number has gone up actually so uh, likewise i said we have introduced two things uh, first uh, we have introduced uh, the thermal comfort and demand for thermal comfort and, and how much of, uh, energy we are consuming on that thermal comfort so the solution for thermal comfort is basically air conditioning and i've used the word of uh, the heat trap why it is so uh, there are the, the, it's a trap which is uh, getting us into uh, nowhere actually the warmer it gets the more we are using air conditioning and this is very obvious uh the more we use air conditioning the warmer it gets that's something which is very important which is told by stephen buriani that uh, we are more uh, consuming more and more electricity to run our air conditioners and it is getting the outside the surrounding more and more warmer so we are warming the outside and actually it requires more heat to be taken from inside uh, to be thrown outside and the laws of thermodynamics if you look at that so if you have to reject heat to a uh, to a hotter zone so you will end up spending more energy so so what we are doing is that and if you go to any mall if any any uh, commercial activity center you will see that the outdoor units they are installed are either on the top of uh, the roof or outside somewhere where you don't have a proper ventilation taking place and uh, and uh, we are and if you go there and measure the temperature you will see that the temperature is around 7 degrees hotter than the outside which is the normal temperature so for example uh the temperature outside today is like 25 degrees so if you uh, install the air conditioning and you go outside and move to those hotter uh, outdoor units you will see that it won't be 25 degree outside it will be around 30 31 32 degrees centigrade so that means that you are actually spending more electricity to cool the in the environment in which we are staying this is one trap so so uh, we are rejecting heat to a higher temperature zone compared to the normal temperature which we might be having in the in the city or in the urban center the other aspect is that currently there are around 100 1.2 billion units which are installed and this number is going to increase and it is going to increase in where in what places of the world that is very important we already know that most part of the of the uh, of the global uh, uh, west is already air conditioned and wherever it is required so if you go to europe or if you go to some part of the north america it's already uh, having a lot of uh, air conditioned units which are working there but if you talk about most populous uh, regions in the world like china like pakistan and uh, india india is a very huge country and uh, and most of the population they don't have access to air conditioning and as we are increasing uh, the the thermal uh, the temperature is increasing the urban centers are growing and the population is growing so people are more and more moving towards uh, having solutions for their uh, for keeping their uh, dwellings cool so we are going to have more, more air conditioners going to be installed in developing nations and that is going to create a much larger burden on the electricity as well as on the uh, the emissions which are going to come from those countries which are not especially high at this stage but by uh, from now on to 2050 which is some of the targets for the carbon neutral uh, perspective whether it is 2030 target or it is 2050 some some of the countries are looking at 2050 to be uh, carbon neutral so this is going to add 130 gigatons of co2 emissions and that is around going to be 40% of the world uh, carbon budget that's a lot of uh, that's a huge number so this air conditioning is is a very global phenomena and uh, it is going to impact a lot of people around the globe and uh, as we are looking for the current technologies like i have said 
the current technologies they have, they are already having a kind of a trap and this is more exhibiting the trap. This is not only the air conditioning trap, this is the world future we are going towards. The future is definitely hot. And, uh, and uh, as you can see from the IPCC uh, assessment report, uh, the those deserts areas in the in the world which are shown on the map in red color which are having uh, arid uh, desert environment uh, they're going to have much hotter spells uh, as we are more progressing towards increase of the global temperature and uh, with each rise of the temperature there is some decrease uh, there is uh, the increase of the chances of having more harsher weathers and the susceptibility of having uh, more record heat coming. So that means that we are definitely pushing ourselves towards more air conditioning requirement, more thermal comfort requirements than previously. So, so building this case uh, up till now here is that the conventional air conditioning, there are different types of challenges. One of the challenges which I've already told that there will be massive demand for air conditioning coming and the current technology, uh, they are already, uh, it is already uh, suffering from a lot of uh, backdrops. One of them is the efficiency. So uh, their energy efficiency, uh, energy efficiency ratio, which is EER, is we call that uh, the amount of heat uh, it is going to remove for the amount of the uh, of the electricity we are going to supply. So it is uh, current technologies are three star or three point five star, or at max some of, some of the expensive units are four and four point five star available in the in the market. Uh, so what is happening is there that the ratio of the W thermal to the W electrical on this graph, as you can see, it is currently hovering around three to three point five and between four, and uh, we aim to get it above uh, six and five and six and seven uh, in the future. Uh, but uh, the technological limitations are there. And uh, for example, uh, there are limitations from the perspective of the, from, a, from the perspective of the refrigerants we are using and the, uh, and the compressors we are using. But uh, nevertheless, uh, this number is not going to get drastically to fifties or sixties or hundreds. This is going to remain somewhere between a single digit. And uh, as the number of units is going to increase at least four times, the at 3.3 EER, uh, we're going to have a huge demand of electricity, which is going to be required for uh, to fulfill this uh, display and, and, and demand uh, gap, which is currently taking place in the air conditioning industry. The other perspective is the is the flue gases, which are going to come from, uh, or the refrigeration gases, which we call as F gases, which are a lot more uh, potent than compared to the normal or conventional carbon dioxide, which is a common global warming uh, gas. So their potential for global warming is 10,000 times higher than normally uh, the carbon dioxide would be. And uh, it is not only there. Uh, we already know that the, the Kyoto Protocol uh, stopped us from using the ozone depleting gases, but the global warming potential is something which is very, very significant. And these gases are much more stronger uh, in terms compare and potent compared to the carbon dioxide. So this is some of the technological challenges, uh, not only perspective from the uh, the gases we are using, but also from the perspective of the efficiency. So this is the bleak picture which I'm trying to paint here up till now. Uh, but uh, what is the alternate? So as engineers, we think that what the alternate should be there and uh, the alternate should be more perspective and more greener, like I've tried to put more green colors on this slide, that uh, is there any hope for that? And uh, there might be some technological limitations and there are definitely technology uh, limitations from the perspective of the current air conditionings we have, but there are some other techniques which are evolving and coming on the uh, on the global perspective as an alternate to this air conditioning uh, trap. Uh, one of them is the evaporative cooling. And I'll talk about that. This is uh, not a new technology or new idea. It's been uh, conceptualized from the pre-ages we have, maybe in, in Persia and other places uh, where people are already were using the evaporative cooling technology. There are other kind of initiatives which have, people have looked at that is integrating the solar PVs and as well as solar thermals into the uh, into this air conditioning uh, methods. But uh, the alternates compared to this, uh, the flu use of the F gases would be looking at some other technologies and integrating the evaporative cooling with the uh, with the desiccant cooling and what is desiccant cooling? We'll talk about this today uh, in detail. That what we are looking at as a it's not only the heat removal is important, but also the removal of the moisture from the air is also a very important key ingredient of this whole uh, cycle of air conditioning. So 
uh, well, definitely the alternate is to encourage uh, alternate cooling solutions. But what are those and what are, what are the global impacts of those alternate cooling systems? That is prime uh, ingredient of this talk from the next, from here onward. So, like I said, uh, evaporation is one uh, good solution which people are looking, but is it a new wine in an old bottle? So this is the typical uh, air cooler, which in our parts of the world, uh, in India, Pakistan, and in, in even in, in sub-Saharan countries, they're using this. this. is a desert swamp. We call it Lahori as well, where it's a famous city in Pakistan, Lahore. From there, we call it as Lahori. And then it's a direct evaporative cooler normally used in, in different applications, specifically from the perspective of the air cooling. Uh, so if you look at on the graph at the bottom, it is uh, a psychometric chart. And uh, it is a typical chart we use in the on the bottom side. We have the dry bulb temperature, the temperature normally we have, and the on the on the y hat side we have got the humidity ratio, the amount of the uh, of the uh, the amount of the humidity or the air or or the water vapors which are available in the air, and its ratio compared to the to the air uh, mass in terms of the mass ratio. So uh, what we normally follow is that if you go on the left hand side the temperature would be decreasing so temperature at a would be less than temperature at uh, it would be greater than temperature at b and it would be greater than temperature at c if you go left you are trying to do cooling and uh, if you go horizontally towards the left on this graph you are cooling without increasing any humidity ratio so that the humidity or kilogram per uh, or gram per gram or kilogram per kilogram of the vapor to the air is not changing if you go on the red line. But if you go on the slanted line, which is a blue line, which is normally the evaporative cooling line, you, you go left, that is something which is the objective. And if you are doing the direct evaporation, now we know that from the, from the basics that while doing the evaporation, we do local cooling. So the temperature uh, would go down because of the with, with the phase change of the water taking place, the, the temperature would go down and that can create a cooling effect. So if you go on the slanted blue line, this is normally the direct evaporative cooler will be doing that it will be going on this blue line and it will be adding humidity and also decreasing temperature when it is moving from point A to point two B. Now, remember, this thing is very important and critical. Now, I've already said that the thermal comfort is definitely moving towards a lesser temperature in which we can have a, uh, an ambience, ambience which can be cozy. But uh, there is also a limitation on the amount of the humidity we can have. The more humid it is, we will have uh, sweaty palms and, uh, and, the, and the, there can be other parts of other kinds of uh, ingredients which can come from the water into the air that can be viruses and bacteria that can come in. And also uh, the limitation on the amount of uh, vapor addition we can do. So in, for example, when it is moist condition outside, for example, it's a rainy season or it's a monsoon season in some part of the world, like in Pakistan and South Asia. So there you can't really add much moisture into the air because already the air would be a lot of containing a lot of moisture. So if, if the air is already containing 90% or 100% moisture, you can't really cool it down. So if you are in a moist and hot region, uh, so then you don't have this kind of a solution which can take place. Uh, so the solution is basically, which is the alternate and proposed by a number of researchers, specifically uh, Mesut Sanko, which uh, was the pioneer in this work, is that that if you instead of going on the on the slanted blue line, you go on the horizontal, and that is something uh, which was uh, uh, groundbreaking in 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 last two decades. People have worked on this going horizontal, and that is what they call a sensible cooling without addition of the humidity. So you don't really get that humid part of the air coming into into the system. So you are preventing uh, a lot of uh, germs or bacteria. Uh, transmission, you are stopping that. And also, uh, when you are in the uh, in the humid zones, uh, you can still work with these kind of uh, cooling techniques by going horizontal. Uh, but there are some technical technological challenges, and we'll see in the next slide what are those technological challenges and how to mitigate them. So here I have uh, the Mesut Sanko cycle, thanks to Professor Mesut Sanko. Uh, he, uh, he's doing a lot of good research work on this area. So, uh, like like I said, we are going to work uh, in a cascade environment. Now, what I call a cascade is that, for example, if you start from the left-hand side, you can see two arrows of the red coming in. And uh, this is bringing the hot uh, gas, hot air into 
two channels which are into a single channel which is divided into two portions one part is called what we call as dry channel where there is no water and the other part we call as the wet channel where we have a water film uh, and when the air will be passing through these two channels now this channel is separated with very thin uh, separator which is a duct separator and it allows a lot of heat transfer to take place along this duct but uh, this is a very fine small uh, thin <clears throat> thin metallic sheet which is separating these two channels so what happens what happens in, uh, during this flow of hot air in this uh, in this uh, channel is that uh, at, in the wet part of this channel the water gets evaporated because of the high temperature of the uh, of the incoming air so <clears throat> what happens during this uh, this evaporation we know that the evaporation causes cooling and uh, and the other adjacent channel is much hotter compared to this a wet channel because of the evaporation as that has taken place so what happens that across this duct separator the heat can move from the dry channel to the wet channel and this can create a sensible temperature loss a temperature loss we call as simple sensible because we can note that the temperature is not adding uh, the temperature is decreasing but there is no addition of the humidity taking place during that motion from the entry to the exit of this dry channel in the first uh, uh, ducts are having a separator so at the end of this channel we have a wet part of the air which is moist and it is uh, slightly lesser temperature compared to the one which was entered and uh, the uh, the adjacent dry channel it has again a uh, relatively cooler air coming out but without the addition of the moisture which we have talked about uh, earlier uh, in the last slide so what has happened here is that we have sensibly cooled the air without addition of moisture in the dry channel however at the cost of the heat that has taken place during the evaporation at the wet channel so we reject this wet channel air the moist air is rejected to the atmosphere at the end of this duct and uh, this dry channel exit air which is still dry and uh, it has uh, it is at a slightly lesser temperature compared to its original entry point Uh, when it enters into another similar arrangement of the duct where we have a separator separating the wet channel at the bottom and the dry channel at the top so what happens again the air is split into these two portions and in the in the wet portion of the channel we again we get the evaporation which brings the temperature down and again in the dry channel the temperature goes down because of the evaporation in the adjacent cycle and this cascade can go and go and go and we keep on rejecting the wet part of the uh, of the ch uh, water channel Uh, we can in containing that air which is getting moisture and we keep on dividing the the dry portion of this uh, air which is coming from the dry channel and eventually what we get is that we are going horizontally if you look at the psychometric uh, psychometric chart which is shown in the previous slide and it is shown here uh, at the top and that we can see that the air which is moving in the dry channels in this cascade of the channel will keep on moving along the horizontal direction from 30 degree towards the lesser and lesser temperature and uh, and while the other portion which is the wet channel will be moving on a slightly slightly slanted land uh, line which we have already talked about that the with the increase of the moisture we, we can't go horizontal we, there will be slanted line which will be moving towards there is an uh, exit line or the there is a stoppage line which is shown in the blue which is the saturation line that this is the maximum saturation you can do in your uh, air so this is the maximum humidity level which the air can contain it cannot contain more than that humidity and, and whenever if the the air is containing more uh, vapors then it will uh, have a condensate and whenever we, we see that normally if you put a uh, cold can of uh, soda in front of you it will accumulate a lot of water vapors and and a lot of uh, you will see that the droplet of the of, the, of uh, from the airs will be condensing on the outside of this uh, that can the chilled can of the co of the coke and then you can see that dropping off on your table so uh, it is the amount of the maximum amount of humidity that air can capture and uh, we can see that uh, if you go horizontal you can go to lesser temperatures compared to if you go on the slanted Uh, line and uh, this is what we call as the psychometric energy cycle or uh, the temperature going below the wet bulb so the wet bulb temperature is definitely that temperature where you go slantedly uh, and hit that blue line that is called the wet bulb dwb and if you go horizontally you again go to the 
the border line or the uh, limiting line, which is the blue line, but this is called the draw, uh, the dew point. This is the point where you have the dew point coming. So this is that point where the air cannot hold more moisture at that temperature and it will dew out uh, like the dew we get normally in the winter season. So like I said, this uh, Maxerfsenko cycle, which is schematically shown here, uh, that how the cascade of the channels would work. So we can't have infinitely long channels and we can do a, a cascade in a, in a cascade manner. Uh, instead, we have a more compact design where we can have channels laid out in a plate fin heat exchanger type and we can have the, the channels being drawn and moving the air in different directions within the channels, ensuring that we get the same cascade, which I've shown in the previous slide uh, in a more compact design. This is plate fin heat exchanger design. And you can see that there are different flow arrangements we can go for. We can have an arrangement where we can have a counter flow. Then we have a cross flow arrangement, which normally can have uh, at 90 degree. So the cold air and the hot air and uh, the wet air and the dry air, they can move in different uh, directions to each other. They can move opposite to each other. They can move uh, parallel to each other. They can move in a cross arrangement. And uh, this is what the, the different heat exchangers would be. Uh, and uh, there's there's a lot of research going on on this, that what sort of arrangement should be more effective. Uh, the arrangements we have already discussed uh, in different research papers. And uh, we have seen that uh, there are some uh, benefits with the counter arrangement because it gets more, more time to get more evaporation. Uh, but we have a larger pressure drop coming through and there are arrangements which can be cross arrangement. Cross flow arrangement is at a 90 degree to, uh, to each other that the dry and wet uh, air will be having a 90 degree arrangement between themselves. And that can create a lesser pressure drop, but uh, it can uh, lower the cooling capacity. And then we can have a combinational part where we can have a cross as well as counter flow coming through. And that can have, uh, that can answer the problem of having uh, both uh, looking at the pressure drop as well as uh, the cooling capacity. And it can have, uh, eventually the result is that, and it has been possible, we have done that experimentally as well, that the wet bulb effect effectiveness can be greater than 100%, that we can go below the wet bulb point and we can reach the dew point with the 90% effectiveness that it is reaching to the dew point, about 90% of that point. So these are some of the arrangements we have done in experimentation in, in Pakistan in our uh, heat transfer and air conditioning labs. Uh, so you can see that uh, these are the experimental setups which have been made uh, with different arrangements and blowers and different instrumentations to measure the effectiveness of these uh, multi-stage indirect evaporative coolers mostly designed on the concept of Mesosenko cycle uh, arrangement. Uh, I, I think I have uh, very little time with me now. I'll try to uh, summarize some of the findings we have. So here we have uh, the heat exchangers which are present. So if you can peep inside, you can see that there is a white. So if in the first figure, you can see there is a white heat exchanger which is uh, present uh, inside uh, the black uh, coated uh, object with uh, with the spray of the of the noses coming from the top. So these are kind of the different arrangements we have having. So where the water is being spread in the wet channel and the, and the dry channels are kept uh, moisture free. And we have seen different uh, uh, different benefits and pros and cons of having different flow arrangements, which I've already talked about. But that is one part of the, the, the this is, uh, let, let me uh, summarize that. So this is, uh, we, we started with the, uh, with the evaporation cooler and we've already talked about the direct evaporation. There are some limitations on that, not only from the perspective of the heat transfer, but also from, from the perspective of the health issue. And then we move to the indirect evaporative coolers uh, where we have uh, two streams moving in uh, and the dry can be used and the wet can be rejected. And uh, this is the reality of those, how it works eventually in the lab at least. And then, uh, but that is not the end of it. Uh, there are some certain limitations still which are uh, linked with this indirect evaporative cooling, especially when we have high humidity outside. For example, if you go to the coastal regions, uh, the for example, if you go to the Far East or, or in, in Karachi, for example, we have temperatures are hovering around 35 degree, but it is next to the, uh, to the Arabian Ocean. So you can have a lot of humidity coming. So there, these kind of solutions are not really applicable because 
we don't have much of the psychometric uh, space we, which is available. So if you look at the psychometric chart on the top here, that if you go much closer to this blue line, you won't have the much space of air, air cooling taking place. So the more you go closer to this blue line as a starting point, the, the lesser will be the chance for having more air conditioning taking place. So, and most of the uh, population in different parts of the world, they live near the different waterways. So what is the solution? How and we can integrate this kind of solution into a larger perspective and making sure that we get the thermal comfort we want even in the in the humid environments. So one of the solutions which is available and we have done that at, uh, and tested in our labs as well. And also now we are going towards this fabrication in terms of the domestic and commercial unit is basically having a desiccant based air conditioning. Now we are using the same concept of using the indirect evaporative coolers, but we are going to integrate that with some treatment for the uh, for the incoming air. So the ambient air won't be directly entering into the into the um, the uh, into the cooler itself, but but it will be pre-treated before it enters into the uh, into this uh, uh, into this heat exchanger of Mesosenko cycle. So here we can see that there are there's a schematic on the top which is basically indicating two distinct uh, wheels which are present. One is the desiccant wheel, and then other one is what we call as the heat recovery wheel. Now, what is meant by desiccant wheel? We know that there's a lot of, uh, desiccant means that it will be absorbing the moisture. And uh, so if we pass the uh, pass the air through the moisture, uh, the moisture through the through the uh, desiccant wheel, what will happen that the desiccant will be absorbing the moisture and uh, and the air which will, when, when it will be leaving this desiccant, it will be having a lesser moisture. And this is something which we need actually, that this air, which when it enters uh, and leaves the, this, this desiccant wheel, it will be having a lesser moisture and higher temperature. And when it enters into the uh, into this uh, indirect evaporative cooler, it can have a lesser uh, or, or a, a very low uh, dew point. And we have a very large area or large horizontal space available with us where we can drop the temperature from a high temperature to a very low temperature to a region where uh, we can do the air conditioning part. So this is something which we can do, but this cannot be done infinitely. So we, we have a desiccant wheel which can remove the moisture, but we need, need to recharge that as well. So, so the desiccant wheel, wheel, uh, wheel will be having the air taken away, uh, the water taken away from the air and we need to recharge it. So it will be throwing out the, uh, the captured moisture in a cyclic manner. So it's a two duct system. Uh, at the bottom, we have uh, air moving inside towards the supply condition where we have the room, uh, which is where we are residing, for example. The air, moist air will be entering the desiccant wheel and it will go to the heat recovery wheel. Now heat recovery wheel is something we call as, because when it passes through the desiccant wheel, the heat, the, although the moisture will be removed, but at the cost of increasing the temperature of the of the air. So the temperature of the air would increase when it moves from the desiccant wheel and it enters the heat wheel, where that heat can be taken away from the, some part of the heat can be taken away from this, uh, from this hot air and before it enters into the uh, evaporative cooler, the indirect evaporative cooler, and then it goes to supply. And because I said that this moves, uh, this is a double duct system. So at the, at the lower duct system, we have uh, this uh, supply air, which is all, uh, first uh, removing the moisture and then removing some part of the heat. Now that heat is cyclically used in the, in the return side and uh, it will be assisting the air, which is coming back from the, uh, from, the, from the room, from the air conditioned space, it will come back and it will have uh, go through the heat recovery wheel where it will add some heat to the, to the return air and it, it might not be enough because the desiccant wheel might be requiring a very high temperature of the air to discharge the moisture which has, it has taken in the lower part of the cycle. So it will be discharging the heat in the upper part and it, it will require some more temperature, more heat, uh, that only that heat which is coming back from the conditioned spirit might not be good enough. So it may require an additional auxiliary heat source. So through that we can remove the uh, the moisture from the desiccant heat wheel so that it can be recharged and it can work uh, go back to the lower part of the cycle. So this works in a cyclic manner. It keeps on rotating. And uh, at the bottom, we can see the functional of the whole uh, setup and the, in the laboratory we have. And, uh, and for this kind of system, we can have uh, the EER, which I talked about earlier about the, uh, the normal air conditioners we have, which is around three to seven. 
Now this EER can be as high as 50 if we can integrate the solar uh, part uh, of heat increase in the storage tank and the auxiliary heat source, which I've talked about at the top, the red zone, which is shown there is, if it is going to get the heat from the solar part or the solar energy, then it can have a very high ER. In fact, it can go much beyond this 50 as well. So yeah, adapting renewables, the, this, this technology has a potential to adopt renewables, and, and uh, but it, it won't be 100% renewable. It, it will be in an incremental fashion, and uh, this can help in integrating and uh, uh, getting part uh, in the grid parity. And uh, the, the technology will be evolving itself and getting its more and more improvement, whether from the chemical perspective or whether from the efficiency of the, of the process itself. So we can add PV uh, energy into it in terms of the electricity as well as PV and solar thermal in terms of the uh, heat requirement, which this cycle might be needing, especially from the perspective of the auxiliary heat source, which I've mentioned here. Um, so this is the, some of the uh, heat sources we are using, specifically solar thermal systems, uh, which are installed in our labs. We can see that uh, we have evacuated tube, uh, we have flat plate collectors, we have other types of collectors. Uh, recently, we are moving towards the, uh, the parabolic troughs and the uh, different types of parabolic troughs we are going to utilize, which uh, most importantly is the compound parabolic collector extreme left in the bottom. You can see that. Uh, compound uh, parabolic collector, which is a recent work we are working on. So these are the solar thermal technologies we are trying to integrate into the uh, system we have talked about. So this is the complete schematic we have used, the integrated setup, uh, which uses the, uh, the solar thermal collectors in series and parallel, and uh, that heats up the uh, auxiliary source and removes the auxiliary requirements of heat from other types of sources. Uh, and from the conventional source, and this this can run primarily 90 to 80 percent, 80 to 90 percent on the renewable source of uh, electricity and heat, and without requiring uh, the conventional sources. It doesn't run 100 percent, but uh, uh, having even a share of 70 to 80 or 90 percent of uh, renewable can lower uh, a lot of uh, conventional energy requirements and increase the EER to even more than 100. Uh, depending on the uh, location of uh, this kind of setup in different parts of the world. There is another uh, side of this whole thing. Uh, uh, we have looked at the alternate and uh, we have seen that uh, the alternate can mitigate some of the issues we have seen in the uh, in the evaporative cooling, whether by moving to the indirect part of the evaporative cooling or uh, integrating more solar, uh, more uh, renewable energies into this and getting rid of the of the of the gases which are normally released in the uh, in the conventional air conditioning but there is one downside and this is going to be a very important part from the sustainability and adaptability perspective of this kind of system especially when it goes to those areas of the world where we have water scarcity and uh, this is a very important point because this is evaporative cooling and it is using water and a lot of water is used uh, when we are talking about the use of water from the perspective of air cooling. And if we are working in a desert environment, the, the fresh water is not really available. And, uh, and, uh, and, and the scarcity of the water means that if you're using the water for air conditioning as well and on, an, on a very large scale as well. So this is going to be uh, stressing the, the already available water resources. So we worked on this, uh, me and Lasik again, uh, worked on this kind of thing. And uh, we looked at different alternates. And one of the alternate we looked at was that, uh, like we discussed that, that the when we divide or bifurcate the air into two channels, one is the dry channel, another is the wet channel, and we reject the wet channel and we'll use only the dry channel. So why not we use the wet channel and instead of uh, discharging it into that atmosphere, can we use that wet part of the air, which is still cooler than the ambient air? So it has some sort of uh, advantage compared to the outside air, but although it is wet, but it is cooler. So can we use that, for example, uh, if we are residing in a building where there are humans are available as well as, for example, in a, in a store where we can have uh, humans working in different environment and, and the vegetables are kept in a different environment and they are kept at a different humidity levels. So that higher humidity requirement for the vegetables, for example, or fruits to keep them fresh might be the right kind of zone where the produce can have their thermal comfort. So we have talked about the thermal comfort of uh, uh, of humans 
and then there is thermal comfort or human or uh, commodity comfort zone which is the produced comfort zone and that can be used so so here in this snapshot you can see that this the same uh, processing unit the same air conditioning unit can have the, because in in a conventional system and we don't use the the wet air it is discharged into the atmosphere but if we use and and, and divert that wet air into uh, into a different uh, zone of where the produce is available or where they where some of the animals are residing or other uh, things are present we can use uh, within this uh, psychometric chart the we can use that exit uh, air which is wasted into other uh, useful work and uh, by that doing that we can consume or we can improve the efficiency or cop of those kind of system the the cop the system can improve uh, greatly with this kind of uh, applications so here we have for example uh, the conventional system uh, where we can have uh, uh, the so if you look at at the bottom there is some results which i shown that if you have a conventional system then we have uh, a multi zonal system we can see that the the uh, the increase of uh, the mixing ratio and, and the tonnage uh, that can help uh, so the in conventional system we can have like 1.5 tons of air conditioning available and in the dual purpose, purpose we can have as high as 2.49 in a cross uh, flow arrangement uh, the arrangement which just talked earlier uh we can have the similar kind of tonnage capacity can be increased so this is a huge increase of the tonnage capacity compared to the conventional system so up to 38% of increase uh, of tonnage capacity can be obtained by using the the exit air the waste air for for the produced commodities for example as we have shown here so this is something which can greatly improve the net output of this air conditioning system compared to the input we are putting in so this eventually increases the double er which we talked about earlier much higher than the 100 uh, zone so we are talking about the conventional air conditioners working in 3 to 5 or single digit now we are talking about three digit er of these systems which can improve Professor, would you mind closing off so we can move on to the questions? Uh, I'll quickly wrap up the last point. Uh, okay. Thank you for for the intimation. Uh, last point, which is uh, primarily talking about the water impact. Uh, we have talked about other aspects, but again, this air conditioning system is taking a lot of water. Uh, so the one benefit that can be made is uh, that we can recover the water for drinking purpose, and that can produce a distilled water for those people who are living in those. Uh, red zones as shown in this figure so we again rasik and i self myself did some ex, uh, evaluation of those zones and we've taken a proven commercial technology of m50 which is a commercially available cooler and we have done some global assessment on this and uh, we can see that uh, the energy efficiency ratio of such a system where we can recover the water from the exit water uh, from the exit air which is coming from the working channel and uh, that is uh increase that can not only increase the energy efficiency ratio but also can uh, have a higher cooling capacity for such a system and if you look at the global water footprint the overall uh, specific water consumption reduction can be made while recovering the water from the uh, from the wasted uh, working air or wet air uh, which will otherwise go to the air, to the atmosphere we can recover water from there and that can uh, have a levelized cost of energy that can also increase uh, also decrease and we can see that it it can be as low as 16 cents per kilowatt hour so this is some of uh, the findings and work we have done so i'll stop over here and and i'm sorry that i could not really explain the last part of this work in detail but i hope that i have made the gist clear so i'm open for any questions and queries you might have yeah of course let me start with the first one actually which is which is the challenge of the use of m cycle air conditioning systems because its implementation is currently limited uh the challenges like i've said already uh, the m cycle is a versatile system and it it has a lot of benefits uh, but uh, the uh, water addition uh, is one very key area and water is we know that it's very very expansive in some parts of the in parts of the world so and hotter the zones are for example more hazardous the countries and the regions are less the water is so this is some of the biggest challenges of mr sanko cycle perfect the next question is 
Thank you very much, dear professor. My question is very far from your area, but I would like to know your perspective in addition to pointing out economic dimensions in your analysis. What do you think about the same concept that you develop of energy sustainability from social dimensions? Um, there are some portions of the work which uh, which I had to skip at towards the end, towards the uh, end of my talk was about the economic perspective. Uh, the social impact is definitely very, uh, very important to look at, and uh, we haven't really looked into that social impact as yet. Uh, so in future, I would like to look at that from the perspective, for example, uh, there are different uh, regions where people uh, have this air conditioners as a social symbol as well. Uh, not only from the perspective of the sustainability, but also from the perspective of the social integration. So this is also something which we need to think about uh, while making this as compact unit. Yeah. Excellent. Next question. Thank you for your excellent keynote. New and efficient types of air conditioning systems are a need of the world to reach carbon neutrality. But these systems face strong political resistance from the century old conventional air conditioning and refrigeration companies. How do you see a suitable legislative route for the dominance of such efficient methods considering strong conservative challenges? Very nice question, actually, and it's spot on that we have a challenge from those conventional companies and uh, they don't listen to us and they, we point out different uh, lagunas in the design and, and their technological part. But again, uh, when you look at the efficiencies, they are poor. And, and we talked about the efficiency of having three compared to uh, 100 these systems can they can have. So definitely there are some technological problems, but uh, again, uh, this is work in progress. That's the key, it's a work in progress, but well, that's what it is. Final question, which is your biggest challenge to overcome according to your research? I think the biggest challenge is definitely compacting it down and making it more uh, user friendly. So we talk about a lot of research taking place and a lot of things, ideas can, uh, can be matured, but making it for the gen general people and making it as a usable, useful entity is the challenge. Uh, so the normal air conditioners, they are packaged units. They come up with a lot of uh, funky things, but uh, we need to make it uh, uh, for appeasing for those people. If you don't make them, people won't be using it. Perfect. Well, thank you very much. We greatly appreciate our speaker, everyone, Professor Nadim Ahmed Sheikh for your time, your knowledge, hoping to continue meeting on future occasions. On behalf of all the organizers and official supports of the event, we deliver you your certificate of participation, which let me just show you. It's right here. Ta -da! Which will be, of course, sent to you via email. And well, that's it. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you very much. It was such Thank an interesting you very much. presentation. And, uh... Yeah, it is indeed an honor for myself, and it is. Uh, I'm really grateful. Uh, I hope that this is early morning in your Mexico. So this is nine o'clock in the evening we have in Pakistan. So have a nice morning and day, and uh, I, uh, God bless you, everybody. Thank you very much. God bless you too. Well, applause okay. everyone. Yes, it was such a great presentation. We, of course, thank similarly thank everyone for your assistance and participation throughout your questions.